Well, good evening, folks. It's my pleasure uh, to join you tonight to uh, our important 50th anniversary event here at the Harvard University Native America program. We have a really full agenda, so I won't keep this long. I just want to make sure that all of you have had a chance to, uh, to hear from me as the uh, faculty director of the Harvard University Native American program, or HUNAP. Um, presumably by now you're aware that I uh, joined on in this position a year and a half ago. And uh, I'm from Montana originally. I'm an enrolled member of the Aani Grovant Tribal Nation, Fort Belt, Montana. Uh, I come from my dad's side on the Azure and Brisbane families, and my mom's side from the Gone and the Crazy families. And I'm really delighted to be able to welcome you to this event. And I'm going to turn it over now to HUNAP's executive director, Shelley Lowe, to uh, introduce you to the panel. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Professor Gan. Yat e shake a do shadine, she e shelly low yinisha, Bilagana nishle, Nanastasia tachini bashachi, Bilagana dashache do trabaha dashanale, lo cantiel de nasha. Greetings from Cambridge, Massachusetts. My name is Shelly Lowe. I am Navajo from Ganado, Arizona, and I am currently the executive director of the Harvard University Native American program. I want to welcome everybody for joining us and thank you for being a part of this panel this evening. Harvard University is built upon the traditional territory of the Massachusetts tribe. Its buildings, including Hunap and our space, continue to occupy this territory. And I want to acknowledge and thank members of the Massachusetts tribe for the continued stewardship and, cont and support of our important work. Before I turn it over to the panel, who I will introduce in a few minutes, and our moderators, I've been asked to share a few uh, words about our current program and where we are. And I'm going to share some slides with you right now. As many of you know, we are now the Harvard University Native American program, but our roots lie 370 years ago with the charter of 1650 that committed the university to the education of English and Indian youth of this country. And many of us think about that charter today in the work that we do. But our program actually was created in 1970 in the, as the American Indian program at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And I know many people on the call tonight are going to look at this building very fondly, Reed House, the place that became the home for students and the home for our program. The program began with funding from the Office of Economic Opportunity, federal grant that brought in an initial 11 native students to the Graduate School of Education. We fast forward quite a bit to who we are now, the Harvard University Native American program and the topic of tonight's conversation. Our program became HUNAP, not in the 70s or 80s, but in the mid 90s with the leadership of Lori Graham, who brought the program into what we now understand as an inner faculty initiative under the office of the president and provost. Through her work and the work of Eileen Egan, 1998, HUNAP became an interfaculty initiative officially under the university, and our name officially became the Harvard University Native American Program. We brought in our first faculty chair, Professor Joseph Kalt from the Kennedy School of Government, and Leroy Littlebear came in as our director. As an IFI, HUNAP then moved out of Reed House and out from under the Graduate School of Education into the Kennedy School where Robin McClay, Ken Pepian, and Carmen Lopez served respectively as directors. And we will hear from each of them tonight about their time in the program. In 2004, Dr. Dennis Norman, Southern Cheyenne, start, initiated the HUNAP Indian Health Initiative and became faculty chair. In 2007, HUNAP moved out of the Kennedy School into the current location where we are now, the fourth floor of 14 Story Street. In 2007, I came in as executive director and shortly thereafter, we conducted our second program review. In 2010, Jason Pacano, our community coordinator joined us on staff and Samantha Hernandez, our trustee administrative assistant joined shortly after that. In 2019, we were delighted to welcome Professor Joe Gon, who you heard from as our new HUNAP faculty director. The, the mission of HUNAP now is education, community, scholarship, and inclusion. As an interfaculty initiative, we continue to work across all of Harvard schools in support of each of these ideas, themes, and goals. We currently have 76 students that we that are um, 
active in our community, we have 300 plus who have identified as native or indigenous across the university. About a third of these students are undergrad, two thirds of the students are graduate students, and they come from across the US, Alaska, Hawaii, Canada, international countries. Many come from rural areas, many come from urban reservation and suburban areas. And we have over 1200 alumni. We are currently a staff of three with our faculty director. We have a faculty advisory board with nine members. We, have, we work on a provost advisory council on Native American and indigenous issues. We support the Native, America, Native Cultures of the Americas Mahindra seminar. And we serve on the Native American Petitions Advisory Committee and the Peabody Museum's NAGPRA Committee. We offer over 30 programs annually on a normal year. This year we'll have a few fewer programs. These are both co-sponsored and led by HUNAP. We help and host over 300 or 30 student events annually. These are events that are often coordinated by students, both in the undergraduate college and across the graduate schools. We host an annual Harvard powwow and we'll get to that on what happened this year. We host a HUNAP commencement reception every year for our graduates and their families. We do recruitment outreach, both in communities online and via Zoom. And we host campus visits from NAGPRA representatives coming from tribal communities with prospective students and their families, sometimes their teachers and community members. We host visits from tribal communities, many individuals who often just pop into our office because they've heard about the program and they want to come in and see where we are. We have international researchers who come in and want to talk about us and the work that we do. We have government leaders who meet with us and our faculty and our students. And we host artists and public figures. We have a number of student organizations, many of them that are new in the past couple of years. We have an undergraduate group at Native Americans at Harvard College. We have the Future Indigenous Educators Resisting Colonial Education at the Graduate School of Education, also known as FIERCE. We have a Native American Law Student Association at the law school. We have a brand new Harvard Indigenous Design Collective at the School of Design. We have a Hawaii Club of Harvard, a Native American Health Organization at the Medical School, a Native American Student Organization at the T.H. Chan School of Public Health, the Native American Indigenous Studies Working Group, a new Harvard Indigenous Women's Group led by Professor Shawan Kanu, and a new group called the Harvard Diné. Support we provide to our students includes a study space with a comfy couch and a blanket that I think has been in our office since Reed House. I am not sure, but I have a feeling that it's been there that long. We have a conference rooms that students may use for studying, they may use for meetings and events. We offer free copying, printing, faxing, and scanning for our students, um, which they know and they make use, of quite, make use of quite regularly. We have free coffee with a Keurig maker, and we often have snacks depending on events and depending on the time of the year. Um, many times we have loads of snacks filling our um, tabletops and filling all the spaces where our students are. Our students have 24 hour access to the building. We host community feasts. Student, we provide student event funding so students can host their own events. We also provide students with conference grants, research grants, and we have a doctoral fellowship. And when we have individuals who come onto campus, we will often invite them to our office for special meet and greet sessions with our students. Our alumni 1200 plus have been very active. The Native American alumni of Harvard University, NAHU, partners with our program on events. The new Harvard Alumni for Oceania has also been created and is partnering with our program on other events. We have one alumni on the HAA Board of Overseers. We have two current alumni on, as HAA directors and one past alumni, Patrick Johansson. Our social media, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We have a Facebook page, we have a Twitter account, we have a YouTube page. And you can find us, if you have not followed us, you are not, fo you are not part of the thousands of people who are making use of the information we share. There have been some recent milestones and events, some that we are extremely proud about and some that I think are changing the landscape and where we are at Harvard. 
In the spring of 2018, Professor Phil Deloria, many of you know, was hired and became the first tenured Native American faculty member in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. We were delighted when he came to campus and our students were clamoring to take his classes. Shortly after, Professor Taya Miles, Professor Joe Gaughan, and Professor Shawan Canoe also joined us as faculty at Harvard. And for the first time, we had a core group of Native faculty and faculty doing work in Native studies. As we said before, Professor Joe Gaughan became our faculty director in 2019. Shortly after that, it felt like the world shut down. In spring of 2020, we had gotten ourselves into planning for our 50th anniversary. We were planning on a 25th annual Harvard powwow with some very large events to start celebrating this momentous year. Unfortunately, COVID-19 came upon us and everything has been put on hold. The fall of 2020 and spring of 2020, 2021 mark the official 50th anniversary of our program. And I know that we cannot come together in person for any events, but we will continue to offer Zoom and virtual events, and we will plan for an in-person anniversary celebration at another date when it is safe and appropriate to do so. We encourage you to keep uh, an eye on our website and on our social media platforms. If you need our website address, it's www.hunap.harvard.edu. Follow us at Harvard Natives. I'd like to now introduce all of our panelists. Uh, we will hear from each of them separately, and I will also introduce our moderators, and I will turn over them to start our program. Our first panelist, Leroy Littlebear, is a Blackfoot researcher, professor emeritus at the University of Lethbridge, founding member of Canada's first Native American Studies Department, and recognized leader and advocate for First Nation education, rights, self-governance, language, and culture. He has received numerous awards and recognition for his work, including the Officer Order of Canada and the Alberta Order of Excellence. A graduate of the University of Lethbridge, he was one of the first Native people to graduate completing a Bachelor of Arts degree in 1971. He went on to complete a Juris Doctorate degree at the College of Law from the University of Utah in 1975. Little Bear was a founding member of the Native American Studies Department at the University of Lethbridge chairing the department for 21 years. He went on to be director of the Harvard University Native American program. With expertise and training in law, Little Bear has made significant contributions in areas of First Nations constitutional rights, justice, and self-determination. A strong advocate for supporting indigenous worldviews in education, especially through language, he sees understanding worldviews as key to the work of truth and reconciliation in Canada. He stated, the best way of changing ways of thinking is to change ways of thought, he told the audience. Changing the language and thinking in a new language is the best way to accomplish this notion of renewal. Little Bear retired from the University of Lethbridge in 1997 and continues to be active in numerous areas. An active researcher and writer, Little Bear has written numerous articles and books on topics such as self-governance and the relationship between the Canadian federal government and First Nations. We thank Leroy for joining us tonight. Mm -hmm. Robin McClay is Métis and currently the chair of the Fulbright Canada Advisory Board and senior advisor to the president of Vancouver Island University. Before joining Vancouver Island University, Robin was leading the province of British Columbia's work as its executive director of social innovation. McClay's more recent work includes serving as the head of research and strategy at the MasterCard Foundation, the executive director of McGill University's Institute for the Study of International Development and working for more than a decade at Canada's International Development Agency as its director of research and director of democratic institutions of conflict. Before this work, he served as director of Harvard University's Native American program. Some of Robin's notable accomplishments in the area of indigenous development include the work he did to develop the BC government's Aboriginal Economic Development Strategy and his work in developing and managing programs related to indigenous labor market strategies and programs including the federal government's Aboriginal Workforce Participation Initiative. Robin pursued his graduate studies in public administration at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government as a Fulbright Scholar and as a SSHRC Science Policy Scholar. He was also awarded an Aboriginal Achievement Scholarship from the National Aboriginal Achievement Foundation. 
Robin holds his a Master of Science from the London School of Economics and a BA from McGill University, where he graduated with high distinction and as a McGill University scholar. We welcome Robin to our panel tonight. Ken Pepion is a member of the Blackfeet tribe. Ken Pepion is currently a senior consultant at the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education and the Southern Regional Education Board. Ken retired as Associate Vice President of Academic Affairs at Fort Lewis College in Durango, Colorado in June 2017. Prior to joining Fort Lewis College, Ken was Director of Faculty Programs in the Office of University Relations and Fellowship Programs at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Ken has also served as Executive Director of the Harvard University Native American Program. Ken has directed projects funded by the National Institutes of Health, National Science Foundation, and the Department of Energy and has served as consultant to foundations and federal agencies in the areas of American Indian education and policy. His past services include membership on numerous boards and committees dedicated to advancing equal access to higher education in the sciences by Native American students. In 2000, Ken received the Presidential Award for Excellence in Mathematics, Science, and Engineering Mentoring. Ken received undergraduate and graduate degrees from the University of Montana and Montana State University and completed his PhD in higher education policy and administration at the University of Arizona in 1993. We welcome Ken to our panel tonight. Mm -hmm. Carmen Lopez is a citizen of the Navajo Nation. Her family is from the Black Mesa area of Northern Arizona and she grew up in Farmington, New Mexico. Carmen is the executive director of College Horizons Inc a national nonprofit that supports the higher education of Native American students by providing pre-college, college access, and pre-graduate programs to Native American, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian high school and college students from across the nation. Prior to College Horizons, Carmen was the executive director of the Harvard University Native American program and served on committees including the Faculty of Arts and Sciences Committee on Ethnic Studies and the Harvard Foundation for Intercultural and Race Relations. She was an admissions reader for the Harvard Kennedy School's Master in Public Policy program and a reader and site visitor for the Harvard Project on American Indian Economic Development's Honoring Nations program. Carmen volunteers her time as a member of many boards, committees, and work groups devoted to increasing access to post-secondary education. She earned a BA in history, modified with Native American Studies from Dartmouth College, and an EDM from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. We welcome Carmen to our panel tonight. Our moderators tonight who have given many um, uh, messages of insight for how we can run this, um, and I'm just delighted that they've been able and willing to join us tonight. Mr. Alan Ray, S. Alan Ray, is a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. Prior to his retirement in June 2020, Allen served as president of Fisher College and president of Elmhurst College. Earlier in his career, he held leadership positions at the University of New Hampshire senior, as senior vice provost and Harvard Law School as associate dean for academic affairs. Before entering higher education administration, Allen practiced law for six years with firms in Los Angeles and Boston. Throughout his career, Allen has tried to bring his experiences as an educator and administrator to bear on issues of concern to native communities. He served for several years on the advisory board of the Cherokee Nation Language Immersion School. In 2010, President Obama appointed him to the National Advisory Council on Indian Education. During his eight years at Harvard Law School, Allen volunteered on numer in numerous HUNAP roles, including faculty advisory board member. He chaired the Provost's first HUNAP program review and served on the Harvard Peabody Museum's NAGPRA committee. He played a formative role in expanding the law school's indigenous people's curriculum, participating in fundraising efforts that led to a $3 million gift from the Oneida Indian Nation for an endowed chair in Indian law. He assisted NASA members in bringing the Navajo Nation Supreme Court to campus for a session, and as lecturer on law, led a reading group on Native American religions and the law. Allen holds a PhD in religious studies from the Harvard Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, a JD from UC Hastings, a master's degree on theological studies from Harvard Divinity School, and a bachelor's degree in philosophy from the former St. Thomas Seminary. His spouse, Angela Katsos Ray, was HUNAP's director of development from 1997 to, to 2000. They, meet, they met in the iconic Reed House. Thank you, Alan, and I know your wife is here tonight. 
And our moderator, Eileen Egan, who many of you know, and I know many of you praise, Eileen Egan for nearly 20 years has partnered with executives, boards, and staff to empower them and their organizations to reach their goals through the effective use of resources, strategies, and the facilitation of vital conversations. She also provides philanthropic advisory services to foundations, individuals, and families. Eileen brings a breadth of experience in resource development, program management, community development, narrative change, facilitation, strategic planning, and board governance. She has insights into a wide array of organizations at the national, regional, and grassroots levels, spanning higher education, foundations, grant makers, and rural nonprofits. Eileen previously served as the fundraising director at the American Indian College Fund for 11 years to support the nation's tribal colleges and universities with her expertise in major gifts, planned giving, corporate relations, foundation relations, annual giving, and prospect research. She also worked at the Harvard University Native American program focusing on student affairs, recruitment, and advocacy. Eileen was a senior program officer at First Nations Development Institute, working on capacity building, narrative change initiatives, and online giving platforms. A member of the Hopi tribe, Eileen served on the board of directors for the Hopi Education Endowment Fund, Arizona Indian Living Treasures Awards, Stories on Stage, among others. She presents and trains on topics such as board governance, narrative change, capacity building, diversifying fundraising revenue streams, building individual giving programs, major gifts, planned giving, and strategic planning. Eileen earned a master's degree from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And I am just delighted to turn it over to the moderators and to start our conversations. Thank you very much, Shelley. Rocio Nagata, hello everyone. Uh, I'm privileged to be uh, performing in the role of moderator this evening. And I'd like to get us started uh, off the top by asking each of our panelists to spend a few minutes telling us what do you regard as the highlight of your career thus far? Let's, let's have uh, some thoughts on that. Let's begin with Carmen. Carmen. Um, my, my highlight is I got out to play uh, in the snow with my kids today. <laughs> it's, it, I, I, it, I think in seriousness and it's really wonderful to see you all and to be on this panel and uh, I'm looking across the participant names and it's so amazing to see you all. So really a thank you for organizing this HUNAP and congratulations to, for our 50th anniversary. Um, to me, to me I, I think in this, this pandemic time, I've really been reflecting actually on my children um, and, and thinking about what I hope that they will say about me at some point of the type of person that I am or as an educator, teacher, um, helper to other people. I think that's becoming more and more important is how my own children see my work in the world. And that matters more to me in a way that I don't think previously had. Um, I also think that in this time, it's, I've been using this mantra of uh, what it means to be a good relative uh, during, during this pandemic. And it's something though that was important in our College Horizons core values, but it's something that I've really been taking in of, of how can I be a good relative to others, including students uh, or parents that we're serving. So I, I don't know, I still think that I'm, I'm evolving. I, I still um, have a way to go in my career, but I, I just hope that I continue to be of service to students um, accessing higher education. And it's great to be here. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Leroy, can you tell us uh, what do you regard as the highlight of your career so far? Thanks very much, uh, Alan. Uh, I have many highlights. And by many highlights, here's what I really mean. I, when I graduated, let's say, from law school, I could have gone out into private practice and made a living for myself, my wife, and that. And, but what I was told by my elders and, you know, other mentors was to, to 
serve our people. And the way I was able to best think of how to serve our people was to go and teach at an institution of higher learning. And the University of Lethbridge and Harvard University gave me that opportunity. So the way I think about it is rather than just working in a silo as a private law practitioner, if you're able to graduate 10 students, 20 students out there in the world, there'll be that many more of you out there in the world spreading the good news, so to speak. So when I say I have many highlights, every time a, a student graduates from the university, whether it's from Native American studies, whether it's from one of the programs here at Harvard, hey, that's another highlight for me. So those are, that's what I mean by I have many highlights and I'm very, very proud of our students and the wonderful work that they're doing out in the world. As Harvard says, you come here to learn, go forth to serve. Good, good, thank you very much. And Robin, the same question to you. Hi, it's, it's great to see you all. And I'm, I'm really honored to be a part of this panel. And it's, <clears throat> it brings back so, much, so many memories to kind of reconnect with a few of you on the, on the chat. I've already had a couple of exchanges with uh, Suzanne, my, my good old colleague, uh, uh, Angela Katsos Ray, and uh, of course, uh, Matt Clemens from the Director of Admissions at the Kennedy School, who I still work very closely with. Um, in terms of the real highlights since I've moved on, you know, it's interesting, we were reading all of our bios and they all sound really impressive with all the great things we do, but mine, mine really comes down simply to the work that I'm doing to um, provide opportunities for Indigenous people to access higher education. And, and um, I still do a lot of recruiting to Harvard, but um, in all the institutional roles that I've been connected to, I've, I've really tried to um, educate and influence and um, get them to kind of join me in my mission, uh, in my mission of sort of building these bridges. Um, a, a couple of great examples is when, when I was at MasterCard Foundation. It's, I think it's the second largest private foundation in the world now. Um, they started to recently program in Indigenous education and are starting to direct more of their um, foundational dollars to support that access. And, and not just with scholarships and um, financial aid, but with all the support and wraparound services that are required to ensure that um, Young, young people get a meaningful education. The same thing goes with my current role at Fulbright where um, we've done a lot to support um, Indigenous Native American um, access to higher ed. And um, I'm just continuing on that mission. And I think um, my time at Harvard really gave me the confidence and kind of the global outlook to um, find ways to kind of expand my reach and influence change that sort of is beyond what I call a little puff of impact to one that's more sustainable and scalable. And uh, again, I'm very grateful um, to, um, to connect with you all. And I really wanna call out the leadership of uh, Shelley for organizing this, um, the new um, program director, Joe. And um, I always, want to acknowledge um, just the important role that Eileen Egan played. I don't think she ever got enough recognition, but she was really the glue that kept this whole program together. She, she made sure that we paid attention to students, to the cultural events. She took such good care of the students. And um, again, I just want to kind of formally acknowledge my appreciation and that role that she played. But thank you again, Alan, and thank you very much for uh, your, your kind um, introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. And 
Attorney Ken Pepion. Ken, what would you say your highlight of your career has been so far? Well, the highlight of my career, it's, uh, it's been a long career. I, I started as a counselor in the TRIO programs at the University of Montana in 1979 when I was about 12 years old. But I, uh, <laughs> I quickly became uh, uh, the assistant director at the Native American Studies the following year, and I had the opportunity to work with um, Dr. Henry Mann, who many of you know, uh, who continues to be a, um, a mentor and, uh, and a source of inspiration for me, um, and uh, continued on with that program for about eight years and served as the acting director of the program when Henry left to the uh, U.S. Department of Education. Um, but as far as the, 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 the highlight of my career, I guess, I, um, back in 1994, I worked with the uh, Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education, WICHE, and we were fortunate to get a um, fairly large grants from um, few charitable trusts and Ford Foundation, several others, to begin a program to uh, recruit and retain more minority students into uh, faculty positions. And uh, that's been a long-term interest of mine. I, uh, when I did my doctoral program, I focused on um, issues in minority faculty promotion and tenure. So it was important for me to see more faculty of color, particularly native faculty, obviously, um, in faculty positions. So we uh, developed a program of support um, for uh, students from African-American communities, Latino communities, and Native American communities uh, as a partnership with, with the Southern Regional Education Board and the uh, New England Board of Higher Education. And um, gosh, we started in with about 50 scholars, as we call them, from around the country. And, um, watched that program grow even after I left WICHI to go to Harvard and subsequently other positions, but still affiliated with them, to right around 1,500 students every year that we gather in one place for three days. Um, and, uh, you know, that's become the largest uh, gathering of minority doctoral scholars who aspire to faculty positions uh, in the country. So I think in terms of, you know, the biggest impact and probably the longest lasting legacy, that was probably uh, the highlight of my career to be a founding member of that particular organization. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Going forward, it occurs to me that when you ask someone their greatest accomplishment to date, you inadvertently expose their values. And I think that's true in the comments we've just heard, namely that the common values that we're hearing are values of education, of community building, and of giving back. Uh, I'd like now to turn to how our uh, directors have applied those values, if I read them correctly, and I think I do, how they applied those values to their work at HUNAP. Uh, our theme now is building the infrastructure of HUNAP, and the questions for each of our panelists. Uh, say a little bit, if you would, about the goals of the program during your time at HUNAP, and a little about the critical moment or moments that strengthened the program during your tenure and how did uh, that shape uh, affect what the program is today? So the goals of the program and critical moments during your tenure that strengthened the program and how is that evident today if you can. Uh, let's begin again with Carmen. Uh, so for the, the goals at the time that I came that I came in and this is I think always interesting as we were pre preparing for this call, um, you know, and it'll be interesting to see as students or alumni how you saw things or experienced your time at, at both your institution, whatever institution you're attending at Harvard as a student, and then what you felt and experienced at, at HUNAP. Um, because also as administrators, we're, we're, we're trying to shield students from certain things. We're fighting for certain things. They, you, your job as a student isn't to know all of the things that we're trying to navigate. 
um, as we go through it. But sometimes you might not also understand the, the work that was built before us uh, that we're building upon or um, that we're, we're not um, sharing all of the strategy that we're trying to do in building relationships, for example. So I think this is interesting just, just to, to, now that I'm not the director and don't have that pressure as Shelly does, um, you know, you can, you can think about it in a different way. Um, and, and I think students experience it in a different way. But for, for, for me, when I, when I was there between 03 and, and 08, uh, I had just the interfaculty or the internal and external review of the program had just concluded. Um, there was a little gap between Ken uh, and my time. So I was coming in on a time when there was not, not a director. Um, Lee Bitsui had taken over to, to fill in for that work. Um, but, but the internal external review had just been completed. And our still primary goals were to focus on teaching and research development, strengthening the faculty work, um, student support services, which included working with um, admissions officers from throughout the university, and then um, community engagement. How would we um, be in service to tribal nations and organizations out there, especially through the nation building uh, one and two classes? Um, so, so the goals for me was uh, initially I had to come in and do a lot of listening in the first year. I needed to understand where the community was, how the students felt, and what they what they were looking for. Um, and, and then um, I think the the critical things that I moved through during my time there, I listed down three of them. Once the review was complete, this is when Joe Kalt and I were able to go in to, um, to talk with the provost about finally getting secured core funding. This was really, really something, again, that I have to give my predecessors on this call, Lori Graham, um, Bill Demert, um, folks that had worked so hard, Eileen as well, stepping in all the time for student services. Um, uh, building upon the work that they did, you know, to, to move things forward. But the core funding that we got was huge. I remember going in with, with prayers, walking around the yard, Harvard Yard, asking, you know, for, for strength, going into that meeting and finding out if we would get that secured funding. So for students, it's, it, it's that we needed to have that secured funding from the institution um, that we knew would be there. The interesting thing at that time, too, was that um, the core funding was set to support student services and student services, which was always a, a contention between are we a program of student services or are we a program of teaching and research? Because unlike other institutions that have an NAS department, academic, and then you have a student services side of things, we were putting the two things together and we felt that they had to stay together. We did not want them to get separated. So that was one of the big pushes. So, so to get the core funding that actually supported the student services was huge. Uh, I think the two other important things that happened in my time there, and this is more from this administrative side versus I think the, the community student engagement. Um, the visiting scholar line that we had that typically uh, David Burgess had been in that position for several years. I started to form more of a strategy within the Faculty of Arts and Sciences in the, the ethnic studies. So I turned that line into working with Com um, Committee on Ethnic Studies to start to build visiting professors in for the, the idea to create, bring someone in early on to, for colleagues and departments to have a look at them to potentially down the road offer tenure position. So um, that was um, another important part of building up faculty uh, and relationships within FAS. And then of course, um, uh, bringing Dennis Norman in as the faculty chair. Um, and he had a strong relationship with Steve Hyman from their work in, in mental health. And that was really critical at the provost level to have that type of um, uh, immediate relationship and rapport to kind of help um, you know, talk to the provost on that level about what our impact was. So Dennis was able to do that. And it was a real delight 
to bring him in. Um, and, and that was really, I think, important. The me taking on this, the it really focus on the administrative role with my faculty chair, helping to build out the teaching and research side, and then having this additional faculty line within, within FAS. So I, I think for me, those kind of three were the big administrative um, um, opportunities. Later when we get into program, there was a lot of wonderful things from the 350th anniversary, uh, the Harvard dig, a lot with NAGPRA and um, um, working with the Peabody Museum, Bill Fash, um, Trish Capone, folks uh, that were there. Um, and then even with the 350th, having Carrie um, Vanderhoop come to give the uh, invocation at the morning exercises of commencement. Um, so much work with Patrick jo Johansson to, to build up um, and lead with Dr. Counter, Alan Counter, um, work on Joel Iacum's um, post uh, posthumous degree. Um, there were so many incredible things that we were able to experience kind of also around that 350th uh, celebration and many of it led by amazing students like Judy Cortez who, who helped to run that. Great. Thank you very much, Carmen. Uh, let's turn to Leroy. Leroy, can you tell us a bit about what the goals of the program were during your time? Uh, as director and what are a critical moment that strengthened the program during your tenure? Um, yeah, when I, when I came to Harvard, I uh, made it a point not to do too much at the very beginning. I wanted to see how Harvard operated. And so that I would know where to pull the strings, so to speak. Because I came from a small school, University of Lethbridge, and we had established the Native American uh, Studies Department. It was a full-fledged department where you could major in Native American Studies. We were offering up to 15 courses each semester, you know, in our program and so on. We were, <clears throat> we were just like any other line department within the university. <clears throat> so I wanted to see how Harvard op operated and so on. And the what, what I really had in the back of my mind was somebody had told me that had long career in a university. He said, you know, a university is about degrees, university degrees. That's what a university is about. A university is about research, okay? A university is about courses. A university is about course credits and so on. Say, and if, you, if you're going to be on the table, in other words, be part of what a university is all about, then you have to be one of these things or all of those things. And that is, you have to be about degrees, you have to be about course credits, you have to be about research and so on. If you're not any of those, you're not really on the table. And you would be like a little kid that wants notice over here when you're sitting at the table and they're jumping up and down, you know, making noise to get attention. He says, but if you're on the table about what a university is really about, then you can become part of family. When I realized that, I noticed, I 
yes, when I started to see how we, we Harvard operated, I noticed that we had a brand new president. Rudenstein had just taken office. And I noticed that the real, the real going on, if I can put it that way, was in the faculties or the schools, the business school, the law school, health, and so on, you know, in education, etc. So, in other words, there was a little bit of inter, you know, inter uh, faculty rivalry and so on. And this Rudenstein, I guess, noticed the same thing, because if I'm not mistaken, he came from Princeton over to Harvard. And when he came, he noticed this silo approach, so to speak. And he was, you know, he wanted the university to work a little bit more together, the faculties together. And that's the reason why he started and implemented the interfaculty initiatives. When I saw the picture, I said, hey, we need to, we need to really emphasize this opportunity that Laurie Graham and them worked on in being an interfaculty initiative and bring the, try and bring a family feeling together and see if we can be on the table as opposed to being kind of on the side where we have to jump up and down to really get notice. And so my whole effort was to see if we can bring about the a good academic program. The student service program was doing very well with Eileen at the Hallam and so on. We need the academic part of it. And with those two operating well, we will be, you know, we will have an excellent program. We'll have an excellent QNAP program. Now, we had just set it all up and someone, and unfortunately, family, you know, in this case, that's in our family of both me and my wife. You know, three of our parents, passed away in quick succession. And that was, mm -hmm. that brought us back home. Had it not been for that, we would have been, we would have kept working towards that goal of being part of the overall Harvard family of what a university is about, being on the table. Yeah. Thank you very much. I, I think one theme I'm detecting here is uh, there, there are a couple of tension points that have always been part of HUNAPS, and you, both you and Carmen have identified them. One within the academic realm is this problem of silos and cooperation among them, which operates mm -hmm. within the academic realm. The other tension uh, that may not be unique to HUNAP, but certainly was always present there during the time that I was there and I would say all of you, uh, was the tension between are we about serving students or are we about education or, or about degrees and being on the table, as you put it, Leroy. Those mm -hmm. two tensions, I think, have been part of our history. So let me ask Robin and then Ken if you could comment on what uh, you see the goals of the program were during your time there and what was the uh, critical moment that strengthened the program uh, while you were its uh, director. Thanks, Alan. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you talked about those tensions because there, there was those tensions for sure. When I first started, and as many of my, my colleagues can attest to, we were under a lot of pressure to assert ourselves as an interfaculty initiative. And I, I found myself during my first month um, in New York City with Harvey Feinberg sitting in front of donors or, or just always trying to um, um, 
you know, focus on the bottom line and the resource mobilization pressures. That's where um, it was great to have the support of, of Angela as my colleague, because she, she made me look pretty good in, in terms of some of the successes we had. But I, I found that um, that was a that was a pretty that was a, a lot of pressure that I don't think a lot of people understood. We had we had we had a, a tremendous amount of um, pressure to to um, move forward and get get our kind of advancement in order and work closely with uh, with uh, the provost office and the, the advancement teams. Um, and at the same time, um, I think some of the um, critical moments that kind of really made me appreciate the you know education as that key determinant of of social progress and economic prosperity was kind of the student centricity um, part of um, of Hune, of UNAP and, and the attention that we that we um, paid to students and again going back to Eileen but, but people like David Potter I remember when he'd uh, I, I know many of you remember him but I, I just remember when he he'd, he'd, he'd um, he'd organize these breakfasts with the Hopi kids that he'd bring to campus. I remember traveling with him down to the Hopi nation and eating blueberry pancakes, but those were kind of the critical moments. It wasn't the, the big research papers that, that we presented or the big gifts that we brought in. It was when I could see how education really touched the students in profound ways and the impact that it not only had on them but on the communities like like many of the students that i helped to encourage to come to harvard from canada i, I just see that what that represented to their communities where many of those students and their children now are pursuing something that they never thought was in the cards for them but you know just as education was one of the most devastating historical things that happened to indigenous people it's great to see that um, there is that connection now between um, the role it plays to kind of meet the goals of, of reconciliation and and um, um, provide that important empowerment, not just to the individuals, but to the communities that, that they're a part of and that they serve. So those were some of the profound moments. It was often those little things that just kind of gave me those moments to reflect and think about the, the real purpose of what a, a, what a Harvard education represented. And um, um, even though all of those other pressures at a complex institution were there, it was refreshing to, um, to find those pre precious times to, to spend with, with students and to be a part of their journey. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. And I want to assure you that if, if Angela helped make you look good, uh, during your tenure, she's still doing that with me. So. And, 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 you're, and you're, you're looking as dapper as ever. No, nope, thank you. Back at you. <laughs> Ken, how about, what yeah. do you think? Well, Robin and I overlapped a, a bit, I think, um, for during the first year, perhaps when I was there, Robin was a Fulbright fellow, so I was able to, um, to tap into his knowledge and experience and expertise um, while the time he was there. And I just want to echo, I guess, what my colleagues have said, Leroy and, and Carmen um, and Robin, about sort of standing on the shoulders of folks going way back to the time when student activists were the ones that kind of tried to bring it to Harvard's attention um, that they are there. And uh, I think the subsequent work that was done by uh, the uh, previous directors and so forth um, really laid a foundation. Uh, and that foundation was well begun, well started by the time that I got there. Um, I, you know, coming from a um, experience of native studies programs uh, that combined student services and I was active in sort of both of those realms. Um, I mean, I knew those tensions, but I also knew that you had to be both and that we, we could be both. And I think, you know, there, it wasn't so much um, moments, let's say, but some of the things that started that we weren't able to do before because of some gifts that Angela and, and, and Eileen and others were so active and uh, uh, fortunate to, to get to us, we were able to start, um, I think, a community of scholars at HUNAP that perhaps wasn't there before. 
Mm -hmm. The uh, 1665 Fellows, for example, yep. supported several um, doctoral students, um, some of whom I've seen their faces now, <laughs> Tim Begay, hi Tim, and others, uh, as, well as, uh, as well as some professional um, folks that we brought in. They could have been you know, Harvard graduates or others that are working in Native American issues around the country and, uh, and a visiting faculty fellow. So I think that core group there that really developed a community and a really vibrant community, mm -hmm. uh, Native scholars working on that was a good combination to what we were doing in the way of um, student support. And, uh, you know, in terms of goals, I always felt that student support is primary, is the is the primary focus of who. But uh, agreeing with uh, with Leroy, absolutely, there has to be a presence. Mm -hmm. and it has to be, you know, the effort that goes forth by convincing Harvard um, that uh, the exploration of Native American issues is a valid sort of um, uh, intellectual enterprise. So uh, I think we were able to sort of uh, get some traction on that during the time I was there and, uh, and, and move forward in a, in a good way that led to, uh, thank goodness, um, finally, uh, the institutionalization of the program during Carmen's period, which yeah. was one thing I think that always kept us up at night before then. Great, thanks very much. Uh, I'm keeping my eye on the clock and we're coming up on seven and uh, we have uh, asked uh, folks to uh, stay with us uh, until a quarter after seven. So in the interest of time, uh, let me suggest that uh, we try to consolidate our couple of the other two themes that we put out there, panelists, so we leave time for that final set of questions about the future of HUNAP. Uh, and uh, if we have uh, chat questions, Eileen, maybe we could uh, just hold those until we finish the conversation. Um, you're on mute, Alan. Uh, in terms of the two remaining areas, let me ask, given that what Ken just said about the importance of students in it, can you reflect on particular students or groups of students that made a very positive difference during the time you were there? Uh, and this, this gets down uh, into some specifics, if you would. Uh, what students or groups of students really stand out for you? And I'll just throw that open. And uh, if you have someone or some group, uh, just uh, jump in and tell us, tell us about them. Let's see, I can, I can start. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with um, the very first student that I met um, and she's in my journal uh, when, I, when I started and she wasn't even a student at Harvard yet. It was April Yuppie Roll. And she was there as part of Dr. Fershpan's um, uh, summer re research project, the Fort Peck one. Um, and I got to meet with her as the very first student and then the second student that I met was uh, Duane Meat, um, who, who passed away as a, a student um, of ours uh, at the college. But I, I just remember these two in particular in my very first days um, in the office. And, um, and April just gave me such an impression about of, of, of a student, of a young person aspiring and hoping and dreaming and her goals. And I think um, Duane was really important in that first meeting in telling me what it felt like to be a student there on campus and how he, he had support but also felt let down and that we should be doing more. So, so I, I know in that first year, I listened a lot to students to kind of hear where were, they were at so that I could help to build up community. Um, and then I, I, I think um, there's, there's, there's so many of the, um, the undergrads are on my mind a lot just because they came in so much to ask for help. They were, you know, they're the ones that were mad. I remember with um, Erica Scott, man, she was so mad about some ethnic fraud on admissions. And um, that took this great though, you know, you need the student activism, um, like we said, 
to, to push the institution. Now you have to manage that on the administrative side, but you really need them to get upset about things so that you can, you can move things forward. So that was a great one for admissions was that we were able to really go to uh, Harvard College um, and talk with um, Bill Fitzsimmons about people's um, self-identification. Um, and then there's just funny other things. The last one that I'll just say that was also a real highlight for me was when um, we got to go down to Washington DC for the National Museum of the American Indian uh, grand opening and we were a part of the procession. So we flew um, a bunch of students down. Um, that was when Jackie Old Coyote was also there as our administrative fellow or Miller. I'm not sure. I don't know who it was, maybe Bill, whoever it was. Um, and, and we stayed at my father-in-law's house. All of us crammed into his house um, during that week. And that was a really uh, wonderful time to, to get to spend down there. Um, but there's a lot, I have a lot of student mm -hmm. memories, um, but, but I'll just share a couple of those. Okay. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to, to add a story before we? Yeah, I would. To I would. Final set. I would like to, to to add something. It's interesting that uh, that Carmen would mention uh, those students because they're particularly Duane during my time was um, one. Although he was a very, I think he might have been a freshman at that time, but um, so many outstanding students is just you know hard to sweep away the cobwebs after twenty years without leaving someone out and I, I hate to do that, but um, I think Ethel Branch, Dwayne Meat, um, Tara Jean Yazzie, Randy Aki, Tim Begay, Natalie Landreth, and some of those that just stand out to me for the contributions they made to the program. Um, I think Ethel in particular, one story that um, I remember is Joe Colt and I had been down to New York City and we were wooing uh, John Ernst at that time. Well, um, you know, it's one thing for faculty and 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 others to sort of give uh, some grandiose ideas and, and words to potential funders, but I think where it really hits them is when the students talk to them. And Ethel uh, was our representative. She talked to uh, John Ernst and uh, John was able to see the impact that that had on the life of, of someone like Ethel. And um, she was really the, uh, the person who got the funding and we were able like, to again support quite a few students in their research efforts through that, through that fund. Well, um, Ethel went on of course become the Attorney General for the, uh, for the Navajo tribe um, as well as uh, several other things that she's doing now. But, um, I think in terms of the impact that students can make uh, in getting more support for the programs are measurable. Mm -hmm. Excellent, good. Uh, I think uh, if we can cut right now to ad asking uh, Eileen to give us some of the chat questions that we've been getting. Uh, I, I don't want to uh, foreclose those questions reaching our panelists before time runs out on us. So Eileen, would you like to uh, offer up some of those questions? Yeah, we have a question from Jackie Old Coyote. Um, she wants to know um, if you could give some insights into how we can build connections and pipelines from the tribal college movement to Harvard to create connections for recruiting more tribal college students to Harvard College and graduate and professional schools. Mm -hmm. Any insights on that? Um, Carmen, do you want to start with you since you do a lot of work with student affairs today? Yeah. Um, I know that the the funding right now, um, the the tie from the law school that the uh, American Indian College Fund administers that uh, scholarship to go to the Harvard Law School, um, and and you know at the Graduate Horizons that uh, Shelley helped to host um, in I think 2012 um, between between us. One great one that actually Tara Jean Yazi and Hepsi Barnett, uh, right, uh, were also a part of because they worked at the College Fund. Um, this was that Embry Women's Program, and so it was it was a collaboration between Graduate Horizons and the College Fund to to prep the, these women that were were moving forward in their four year degree program and showing already that they're ready to go on to have their sites on graduate school. Um, they, we did prep with them prior to the Graduate Horizons to start to get them ready for that. 
Um, I, I think with, with the tribal, uh, there's a lot of opportunity, Jackie is correct, with uh, tribal college um, students uh, getting access to graduate programs in particular uh, uh, at places like Harvard. I think it just takes that advising. That's what students need is, um, there's both the delivering information to students to plan ahead to see what's down the road. Sometimes they just need the life experience, the academic experience, the work experience for them to finally have that aha moment where it comes together. Um, so, so, you know, graduate school has to be an intentional pathway and have an intentional plan. And you need to be able to experience opportunities to make you more competitive for, for the admission process, especially at places like, like, um, like Harvard. So uh, just, you know, I think the will has to be there. Back if we go to the 1970s, when those 11 students came to Harvard, that was from a federal grant coming to Harvard. It takes the vision and the willpower of the institution to say, we're going to commit ourselves to do this work um, together. And it's not just HUNAP. I'm talking about the, the Harvard graduate schools um, that are saying, uh, we're going to look at our, at, at our enrollment, and we've got to come up with the fellowship opportunities to create the pathway, the entry points for, for tribal college students for example, to be able to come into um, schools like, like a Harvard. So, and Harvard does it all the time. We have all of these fellowship programs, whether it's for a, a staff moving up in, into like the administrative fellows program, we create this in higher ed. We know that we need to invest in cohorts and devise programs that are intentional and specific in bringing um, uh, students into our, our institutions. It just doesn't happen. It's that they need that advising. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And we all need to create more opportunities. And I think as alum, we also have opportunities to be more better advocates for that. So thank you for sharing mm -hmm. that. I know we only have about seven, five or seven minutes left. So our final question right. to each of the panelists, and I'll start with Robin, um, and then I'll go to Leroy, Ken, and we'll fin finish out with Carmen is, what is your, you know, this is the 50th anniversary of HUNAP, and what is your greatest wish um, in hope for the Harvard University Native American program in the future. So can, uh, Robin, we'll start with you. Yeah, thanks. Um, my greatest wish is that we just keep the momentum going. And um, um, one of the, uh, the real um, great things that, I, that I've really enjoyed is just how receptive many of the different faculties have been in their efforts to recruit and kind of break down some of the myths. I kind of mentioned my, my friend, Matt Clemens, who's the director of admissions at the Kennedy School, who's come out to Canada several times to meet with potential recruits and just really humanize the place a little bit more. And um, um, one of the things I, I also wanted to mention just in terms of kind of the influence is um, I'm, I'm collaborating with, with uh, Megan Hill, who, who oversees Honoring Nations and the, the Harvard Project on American Indian Economic Development to, um, to launch a, an Honoring Nations Canada program. So I think we just, just continuing to, to spread the message, to expand our reach and to demonstrate that um, a place like Harvard is not out of bounds and that it can provide all kinds of different opportunities to um, support um, young people and, and access in particular. Thank you, Robin, for your continued work in that area. Um, now we'll move on to Leroy. Yeah. <clears throat> hey. Uh, just very quickly, coming back to students we're very proud of and so on. Hey, I think he's online, and both of them are online. Julian Spirchi, we're very proud of him and the work that he's doing, graduate out of the law school. And of course, Shawan. I knew Shawan when she was a little girl and so on. And one day she came to me and says, I've been offered to go to, to several of these schools. Which one should I go to? And of course I said, Harvard. And here she is teaching at Harvard. We're very, very proud of her. Now, I would say in Indian country, 
it's all about relationships, okay? And I think Harvard needs to, you know, realize that notion about relationships. Harvard should come out a little bit more often out into Indian country. And I think Harvard should also invite high school students to come to, you know, bring them over to Harvard, let them know what it's all about. We know that native people are very, you know, they're getting intimidated by any university, let alone Harvard. But if we bring them over to the institutions, we do that here at the University of Lethbridge. We bring high school students, have an open house for them and so forth. If they knew what it was all about, hey, you'll get more students coming to Harvard and they won't be as intimidated just by the name and by the institution. That would be my advice for Harvard. Great, thank you, Leroy Ken. I think one of the things that I was surprised about when I got to Harvard was a real lack of awareness about sort of the origins of Harvard and the fact that it was chartered for the education of, how do they put it, English and Indian youth. Um, and one of the memories that I have is um, when uh, Larry Summers became president. One of our scholars, and I forget who, had the opportunity to ask him about Harvard's charter. And uh, Larry Summers was not aware of the fact that that language existed in the charter. And that, that was pretty ironic given the fact that there were those, these photos that were sort of splashed during his investiture of him sitting on stage with a copy of a charter next to him. So I think, you know, one of my wishes is that, you know, that awareness continues to grow at Harvard about its origins and its charter and its purpose. And that, you know, HUNAP begins to be, uh, you know, and it is now to a certain extent, but it may be even more so a central part of what Harvard does in living up to its mission. Um, and I hope I, you know, the, the, the that, by doing that, more resources can be made available to the program. It was, um, it was also a little different and people, you know, couldn't believe that uh, coming from a, such a rich and prestigious institution that we had to be out there shaking our tin cup all the time. But that's sort of Harvard's way of doing things is every tub on its own bottom, you're raising your money and you're welcome to stay. Well, um, that's why I was so, so pleased to hear that um, you know, the central administration had finally invested in the program. I just keep hoping that awareness and the, uh, the funding continues to grow the program. Great, thank you, Ken. And now we'll go on to Carmen and then Shelly. I'm gonna let you maybe share a little bit about future events and close out. Um, my my greatest uh, hope for, for HUNAP in, um, is is to be able to fulfill fulfill the dreams of our students and and our scholars um and to continue to have um that relationship and that service oriented vision to give back to communities um i i had shared with the the group when we were preparing for this that some some days that i've had um, hard days in my work at College Horizons when I think sometimes about brain drain and so much of the work that I do in my organization with the 60 colleges we partner with that 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 are not tribal colleges um, in particular and that I thought about are am I pulling amazing native students away from their their home communities and on my low days I, I think about what am I contributing to but, but I have to tell you guys, when, when, when I look at Harvard alums um, or uh, students, my, my scholars that come out of the College Horizons program, and I see the amazing work that, that we are a part of and that we're doing in our home communities, it just reminds me of why access to places like a Harvard um, are still really, really important and critical because I see 
the impact that you are having in our, our home community. So that's the thing that fills me up sometimes when I wonder about what are we doing with higher education and, and why, is it, why is it so glacial in its, in its movement and change? But, but students and, and alums, it, it's just amazing the work that, that we're able to, to contribute to, to our communities and nations. Um, and so I, I hope that, that HUNAP continues to have the support, the funding, the resources to really help our students dream big and do the work that they want to do on behalf of their, their communities. Um, that, that's been an important um, aspect, I think, of the nation building model is how do we contribute um, to, to our tribal nations? And that's part of my work in leaving Harvard was to say, I wanna work on the ground with students and families and communities to be a part of that, just like I'm asking students to do. So that's my, my hope um, for the, the, the future generations. Thank you. Well said, thank you, Carmen. And it's so good to see so many of you tonight. Um, it's been really great to get messages and hopefully we'll get a chance to do more of this. And now I'll just turn it over to Shelly and thank you, Alan, too. Thank you. Oh, yeah, thank you, Leroy. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Carmen. Thank you for the wonderful stories that you've shared and uh, a special thank you to Alan and Eileen for pulling this panel together for providing comments um, and questions to our panelists to talk about. I feel almost every day like I grow up professionally in this program and I have to say I have been listening to HUNAP stories since before I ever got here and I would listen to them gratefully every day. Thank you for the stories. Um, some I have heard multiple times and they're, they're, they're better every time I hear them. So thank you everybody for your stories, for your powerful words and for your hope for our future. Uh, thank you for all of our participants. We also have an upcoming event in February. We are going to put the link for that event into the chat box. Um, you can look also at our website to find out information. And we're going to share quickly um, just a poster so you know what's coming up. As many of you may know, um, it is not just our 50th anniversary, it's the 50th anniversary of our cousin programs, the Stanford Native American Cultural Center and the Dartmouth Native American Program. In February, we will be co-hosting a panel with the Stanford Native American Program, a circle of notable Native American scholars, individuals who have been inducted into the Academy of Arts and Sciences, um, or have received other national recognition. We hope that you are able to join us. This will be a Zoom webinar uh, on th Thursday, February 11th. And please check the chat box um, for the registration link. Again, thank you for everybody who joined us this evening. This uh, session will be posted on our YouTube channel and when it is available, everybody who joined us tonight will get a link to that video. Please stay safe. Please have a wonderful holiday, and we look forward to seeing everybody in the new year. Thank you. Thank you.